Well, good morning again to everybody, and sorry for the weird order of service this morning. I guess we just got to do what we got to do. There's a lot out sick, and um, I'm no exception, but anyway, as you are all accustomed to at this point, we have got a ton of ground to cover and, and a limited amount of time. Courtney's already poked at me for having four pages of notes. So with that, I know you just sat down. Would you stand one more time? Let's go ahead and read our sermon text this morning. And we will get right into it. And I will try my best to not cough all over you, okay? But Luke 21, 27 and 28 says, And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Mark 13, 26 and 27 says, And then they'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. In Matthew 24, 30 and 31, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you one last time and pray simply, as always, that you would bless this time. Um, God, we pray as always that you would help us to shelve our traditions and and things that we would presuppose onto your text, and God, help us to just understand it for the way that you originally meant it, God, the way that you mean for us to understand it today. Uh, Help us to just worship you and and give you our whole heart and mind during this time. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. All right, as we begin to navigate this text this morning, there are several different points that Jesus is making here. Um, And so I thought it would be best to kind of segment it or bullet point it out, you might say, and just work down that list. And so you'll notice, (coughs) excuse me, in your handout that there are four main kind of bullet points. And it's broken down like this. There's sign of the Son of Man in heaven, tribes of the earth mourn, coming in or on clouds, and then gathering his elect, redemption drawing near, and loud trumpet call. And yes, those last three all do go together. Um, But one thing that I want to remind you of right out of the gate here, is that Jesus is still answering questions. Like in this <clears throat> entire discourse, if you remember, that there hasn't been a break or a pause yet, right? They, they asked him some questions, and Jesus is answering those questions still. And do you remember what those questions were? We looked at them in, I think, our second week together. They were this. They asked him, he tells them the temple's going down, and they ask him, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, or your parousia, and of the end of the age. And if we're gonna, and if we're able rather to understand that he's still answering those questions, then I think that the things we're gonna cover this morning are gonna make a whole lot more sense. Because this isn't a detached thought or anything like that. He's still answering those questions. So with that, let's look at his first point, which is <clears throat> the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Now, as always, you guys know this by now, but whenever we're looking at English translations, of the Bible, there's always going to be variations, and periodically some of them just whiff it, all right? Some of them are just plain wrong, and this is the case with some of them in Matthew 24, 30. Um, The Christian Standard Bible, the New American Standard Bible, and then a couple other (coughs) of the lesser known ones all read this verse this way. They say, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Um, That wording is extremely misleading. That, because that is not how the Greek reads, not even close. As a matter of fact, Young's literal translation has it this way, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in the heaven. So for one, in looking at Young's translation, where is the location given? It's not the sky, right? It's not this big blue space uh, above our heads. It says it's in the heaven. So we have that, but secondly, <coughs> this text is not saying that there will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Thanks, Jordan. Um, That's not how it reads. So a better rendering in English would read this way, and I put it on your handout there, but it it would read, and then shall appear the sign that the Son of Man is in heaven. Uh, That captures the idea better. Does that make sense in reading that? So Jesus isn't saying you're going to see a sign in heaven, like something happening in the sky that you're going to visibly observe. He's telling them you're going to see a sign that indicates I'm in heaven, rather. So, I mean, there's some nuance there, but we need to understand this. You're going to see a sign that tells you I'm in heaven. So what was the sign then that the disciples would see 
that would indicate that he was in heaven. There are a bunch of different opinions about this, okay? And we can get bogged down trying to overemphasize the chronology of all this judgment language and this apocalyptic imagery. Um, and if we do that, I think we'll do more harm than good because, <coughs> excuse me, here's the deal. Regardless of what you want to say is the sign, regardless of which view you land on, um, we know that, number one, it had to appear, if you remember, immediately after the tribulation of those days, right? Well, what days are we talking about? This was in 70 AD um, and within that generation. So if you disagree with me and my opinion on what I think the sign was, that's fine. Um, but that being said, I tend to agree with J. Marcellus Kick, who wrote this. <clears throat> he says, a sign was not to appear in the heavens, but the destruction of Jerusalem was to indicate the rule of the Son of Man in heaven. And then along that same line of thought, Keith Matheson um, from Ligonier Ministries, he wrote this. He said, in other words, the destruction of Jerusalem will be the sign that the Son of Man who prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem is in heaven. So these two guys believe that the destruction of Jerusalem was the sign that the Son of Man, that Jesus Christ, was enthroned in heaven, which is, <coughs> excuse me, man, which is essentially validation, right? That he is who he said he was, that he was who he claimed to be um, during his earthly ministry. This is a sign that he is the Messiah, which he obviously believed himself to be. Now, we're going to come back to that when we get to the cloud coming section, because all these things are, are interwoven, so hold that thought. But notice what he says happens after they see the sign that he's in heaven. Um, he says, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. This is bullet point number two. Well, here's a pop quiz for you this morning. What nation is tribes associated with in the Bible? Israel, right? It's always associated with Israel. So you have the tribes there, but then he also says tribes of the earth. Well, guess which Greek word is used for earth? We ought to be familiar with it by now. It's the word gay, G-E, the word gay. It's the land. It's always in reference to Israel. So again, this the point in saying that is this is not this big... Uh, earth-wide global judgment event, but rather it's still a localized judgment like we've been seeing where the tribes of Israel would mourn. Now, this text here in uh, the Olivet Discourse is a direct parallel to Revelation 1-7, which says this, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen. That word John uses that's translated whale is the same Greek word as the word Jesus uses for mourn. So John is saying almost word for word the exact the same thing Jesus said. But something John adds there is even those who pierced him would see this coming, right? He says, even those who pierced him. My opinion, church, is that that right there necessitates a first century fulfillment. Does it not? Um, you remember several weeks ago now in Jordan Sunday School class, we were in Acts 2. And it's the day of Pentecost, preacher, or preacher, man, Peter, he was preaching. Peter stands up and he preaches that Grand Slam sermon, right? 3,000 souls wind up saved that day. But look at what Peter told them twice when he's preaching to them. Acts 2.23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. He says, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And then in uh, verse 36, he says, let all the house of Israel Therefore, know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucify. So Peter is saying it was Israel. Uh, he's telling them it was you that crucified, or we may say pierced the Lord Jesus, right? And John says in Revelation 1, it is Israel who would see him coming on the clouds, those who pierced him. There's perfect continuity between these two texts. Now, something else, one other thing uh, before we tackle cloud comings, and I'm kind of jumping the gun here on this with me, but just bear with me. John says every eye would see him. So the question we have to ask is, does that, um, does that right there not necessitate that when Jesus came or when Jesus comes, that it's going to be this physical, bodily, like visible coming? And the answer to that is no, it does not. That word for see <clears throat> that he uses is the Greek word harao. And it can mean this, of mental and spiritual perception, <clears throat> to perceive, take note, recognize, find out, to see with the mind, to know, to become acquainted with by experience or to experience. I know it's a clunky definition. It's on your handout. But um, 
we use the, the word see, you and I do today, 2,000 years later in English, this exact same way. And I'll show you what I mean. Um, I can point at something and you can look and see whatever I'm pointing at, right? Or you can see my point when I teach something or, you know, whatever. You can, you can see what I'm pointing at or you can see my point. And we understand that those two usages of see have two totally different meanings, don't they? If you see what I'm pointing at, that's a visible, physical thing that you see and you observe. But when I say that you see my point, do I mean that when I speak, there's this idea in my head becomes visible and now you can look at it? No, it means you understand what I'm saying, right? You perceive, in other words. Well, that's exactly how John is using this. When he says every eye will see him, he's saying he's coming on the clouds and every person is going to perceive or every person is going to understand that he has come. And he said that when, when he does, those tribes of the earth or those who pierced him, those Christ-rejecting Jews, in other words, when they understand his coming in judgment, they are going to mourn because of the wrath that he is pouring out on them. Now, I, that's going to make more sense to you when we get to cloud comings, all right? But I've, I've mentioned this before, but Josephus records that whenever Rome came in, they were lobbing those big 100-pound boulders into the city there were guys on the tower um, that were recorded as yelling out, the sun cometh, the sun cometh. So they knew, uh, this is historical validation, that they knew exactly what was going on that moment. They knew this was Jesus pouring his wrath out. Now with that, I think that right here would be an opportune time to transition to that discussion on cloud comings because it says he's coming on the clouds and every eye will see him. Um, in other words, this coming event, this parousia of Christ, it isn't regulated to only being perceived by those under judgment. Now, they're included, right, even those who pierced him, but it says every eye will see him. Everybody's going to understand that he's come. Well, how can we reconcile that? Well, here's how. Because cloud comings in and of themselves were not only judgment comings. Cloud comings conveyed God's presence, God's judgment, and God's salvation. Look at Exodus 34, 5. It says, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Numbers eleven twenty five. 25, then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him, put it on the 70 elders. So these are just a couple of a bunch, whole bunch of Old Testament passages that clearly associate this being in the cloud with the presence of God. And that's the point. Um, Yahweh is actually called the cloud rider five or so times in the Old Testament. So cloud comings, being in the clouds, are directly associated with God and with his presence. Now in Psalm 18, we see a cloud coming that brings salvation. So we've looked at passages that show this is the presence of God. Here's one that shows clouds, cloud coming bringing salvation, okay? David writes in Psalm 18, 9 through 12, he bowed the heavens <coughs> and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind, he made darkness his covering, his canopy around him. Here you go. Thick clouds, dark with water, out of the brightness before him, hailstone and coals of fire broke through his clouds. So two cloud references there, all right? David goes on to say in verses 16 and 17 here, he says, he sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he rescued me from those who, were, who hated me for those who were too mighty for me. So here we see that God coming on the clouds, being this cloud language, this results in salvation for David, right? He says he rescued me by this cloud coming, but also judgment for his enemies. So this judgment language can also be seen all over the place. And here's probably uh, the best example of this is Isaiah 19, 1. It says an oracle. Now this is the same word we looked at last week in Isaiah 13 against that judgment on Babylon, right? So this isn't good. He says, an oracle or a burden concerning Egypt. <clears throat> Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt, and the idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. There is a point that needs to be made right here in Isaiah 19, and if we can get our heads around this, um, if you can wrap your minds around this, this language, this thought, what's being communicated here, then you can understand this whole shebang. Okay, because it's not as complicated as we've made it be. But look at this again. He says here in Isaiah 19, this is judgment on Egypt, right? And it says two things. It says God is riding on a cloud 
and he comes to Egypt, or is coming to Egypt, right? That's what Isaiah 19 says. God's riding a cloud, coming to Egypt. We good? Everybody got that? Okay, in the next chapter, in Isaiah 20, we see this judgment take place, okay? And if you read Isaiah 20, the question that, that to answer is how does this take place? How does God's cloud coming and coming to Egypt take place? Well, it takes place in the form of God sending the Assyrian army to fight against and ultimately capture Egypt. So God's coming on or, or riding this swift cloud of judgment um, according to the language of Isaiah 19 and 20. This doesn't mean that God physically descended um, out of the sky, or as Jordan would say, it doesn't mean he's going to bust through the sky on a surfboard or something like that, right? That's not what is communicated here. But rather, his presence is known here through the judgment he brings on Egypt using the Assyrians, all right? So we could say with all fairness to the text that his coming on the clouds is his sending that army to bring that judgment. That's the way Isaiah uses this language. Now, another example, we see this same thing is in the book of Nahum. In Nahum 1.1, it says an oracle. That's not good, right? A burden concerning Nineveh. So is this good for Nineveh? No, judgment's coming, right? Well, look at verse three. The Lord is slow to anger, great in power. The Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is a whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Verse five says the mountains quake before him, the hills melt, the earth heaves before him, the world and all who dwell in it. So you know what we've got here? A big bundle of this apocalyptic language, just like what we've been talking about, just like we're looking at it. But here's the question. Did God physically, visibly come down out of the clouds and destroy Nineveh? No, he did not. But you know what history does record? That God sent the Chaldeans and the Medes to destroy Nineveh in 612 BC, fulfilling this passage. And there are other cloud comings in the Old Testament that point to this same truth. It's the same reality. And the point is this, that this coming on the clouds language is always fulfilled by God sending an army to execute judgment. That's what he means. When he says, I'm coming on the clouds, you might as well understand that to mean I'm sending an army to wipe you out. That's, that's the way the Old Testament uses this. And again, does this necessitate God literally rides a cloud out of the sky? No, it doesn't. Uh, furthermore, you and I do not have the freedom to apply biblical language in a way that this Bible does not. We can't do that. Um, to do so is textual abuse. To make things mean to us something that they never meant to anybody that would have read or heard these expressions. We can't do that. Um, so with all that being said, with this cloud coming, meaning armies coming in judgment, let's go back to the Olivet Discourse in Revelation 1-7. Both texts clearly say that he, son of man, talking about Jesus, right? He is coming on the clouds. Well, in light of how we just saw this language being used in the Old Testament, and I'll remind you, these are Jewish texts, right? Jesus is a Jewish man speaking to Jewish men. All that being said, do we have the freedom then to make this cloud coming mean that this is a visible, physical, bodily coming on the clouds? Absolutely not. You cannot do it. It never means that. We can't make it mean that today. Um, this cloud coming language is never used that way. But I can anticipate the pushback because this is everybody's go-to. They think this is the preterist killer, okay? And it's Acts 111. Here's, here's your pushback. So I want to look at Acts 111 and show you that this does not hurt our position whatsoever. And I've actually got a document I can send you if you want it. I'll probably send it in the group me anyway. Um, but it's a it's like an 11 point argument for why Acts 111 doesn't do anything against our position, okay? But Acts 111 says this, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the heavens? This Jesus who was taking up from, taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So the logic goes like this. Number one, they saw him go into heaven in a physical body. Number two, he's going to come again in the same way they saw him go up. Therefore, number three, he will return in a physical body. That's the logic. Sounds great, doesn't it? It doesn't work when you get into the Greek, okay? We need to understand and remember that this Bible was not delivered. These original autographs were not written in English. They were written in Greek. And that phrase where, where it says same way is the Greek text han tropon. And a better translation for us, even in English, 
is the way the New King James has it. It says this, this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner, in like manner, Han Tropon, as you saw him going to heaven. You see, Han Tropon does not mean exactly the same. It never means that. It, it means in similar fashion or in a, in a comparable way, in like manner. And I'll give you an example of where we see this in the New Testament, just so you don't think that I'm crazy or making this up, okay? We actually looked at this in week one of our look at the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 23. If y'all remember, Jesus is pronouncing that judgment on the Pharisees, giving them the woes, calling them all sorts of friendly names. And then in verse 37, we read this. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as, on tropon, as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. So that word as is the Greek word hontropon, same one we're looking at this morning. So to hold that phrase to mean um, exactly the same way, right? Identical, whatever, then you would have to posit, if we're gonna be consistent, you would have to posit that 2,000 years ago, the incarnate Christ was running around with gigantic chicken wings and he's, he was looking for little Jewish children to gather under his ginormous chicken wings. If we're gonna be fair and hold that wording to be rigid and literal like that. But obviously, it, was that the case? Does anybody here believe Jesus had great big wings? No, I hope not. Um, that's not the case. But what was Jesus saying? He was saying in similar fashion, in like manner, to the, you know, similar to a way that a chicken gathers her brew. That's how I would have gathered your children. So it's not this rigid, literal meaning it means in like manner. That's exactly how the phrase is used in Acts 1.11. Acts 1.9, if you look at it, it tells us that a cloud took him out of their sight. This was the ascension. A cloud took him out of their sight, and that's the point. They saw him go up in a cloud, and he would return, Han Tropon, in like manner, in similar fashion. How? On a cloud. Doesn't have to be physical and bodily. But it is a cloud coming, and that's the point. Now, let's look at some of these timing indicators and then keep moving. Notice in Matthew 24, 30 and 31, Jesus says, and they'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he'll send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. They'll gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. <coughs> Compare this text with Matthew 16, what he said earlier, verses 27 and 28. It says, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of the Father. And he'll repay each person according to what he has done. Then he says, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom. The question we need to ask, is Jesus describing a different coming in Matthew 16 than the coming he's describing in Matthew 24? Absolutely not. Uh, it, it's the same coming. And we've actually got elements found in both texts that make it clear that it's the same coming. You've got people seeing his coming. You've got angels. You've got glory mentioned, right, in both texts. Well, notice the timing. He says there, so basically he says this, some of y'all are still gonna be alive to see me come back into my kingdom. I mean, that's essentially what he's saying. And this fits like a glove alongside Matthew 24, 34, which says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until when all these things take place. That all these things there, that includes Christ coming on the clouds of heaven with power and glory. So here we've got Jesus giving details about his coming in response to a question about his coming in which he says it would be a cloud coming that would happen within their generation and before some of them were dead. I don't know how you get around this, right? I don't know how you get around this having a first century context in fulfillment. But I think looking back at it, it's clear if we ask, did this happen? Absolutely it happened. It happened exactly like he said it would. Do you remember six minutes ago when I was talking about cloud comings, what the conduit was for, God, uh, for God's cloud comings in the Old Testament? What did he use? He used armies, right? The cloud coming was God sending an army to bring judgment. This is exactly what happened in 70 AD. God sent the Roman armies in to fight against and capture Jerusalem. Just like Isaiah 19, he came on the clouds and did it to Egypt. This was Christ's cloud coming. This event was his parousia or his arrival. 
The, and the destruction of Jerusalem marked the end of the Old Covenant Mosaic age. He's answering the questions perfectly. And also the timing of this fits perfectly with the resurrection and harvest from Daniel 12, Matthew 13, which Jesus said would happen at the end of the age. Look at Daniel 12 too. It says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and contempt. Well, what's Matthew 13 say? It says the son of man will send out his angels and they'll gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness will be cast into the furnace of fire. So that's the bad guys, right? He says, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So in both of those texts, in Daniel 12, Matthew 13, you have resurrection, right? And then you've got the good and the wicked being judged in both of them. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 16 that we just looked at? Look again. He said, for the son of man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father. Here it is. He says, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. This is the exact same judgment um, of the good and the wicked. It's, it's all the same event. And he says, some of y'all are not gonna taste death till it happens, till you see me come into my kingdom. So the point is that all of those things are connected together. And this is a perfect time to segue into the final point, which is gathering his elect, redemption drawing near, and loud trumpet call. Because we're talking about the same thing here. Again, all these are interwoven. They're all connected. Look at Matthew 24, 31 one more time. He says, and he'll send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. Well, what is this trumpet all about? Does this mean God's gonna literally like, I guess he is gonna ride that cloud and he's gonna be like blowing a trumpet when he does it? Um, I don't think so. But if we, like everything else, if we look at the Old Testament, it sheds some light on this for us. It teaches us what's going on. You see, this trumpet is from the Hebrew word shofar. And in Leviticus, we see that this shofar was to be blown on the Day of Atonement in the year of Jubilee. Now, if you're familiar with that, you know that the year of Jubilee, um, this signified the releasing of all slaves and, of, and the, the pardon of all debts. It was basically like a great reset for the land of Israel. Look at Leviticus 25, 9. It says, then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the 10th day of the seventh month. On the Day of Atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout your land. So the reason that I point this out is, again, we, we were talking about the feast days, the redemptive plan of Jesus Christ follows that pattern of those seven feast days. And we've been looking at them on Sunday nights and we haven't made it yet to the three fall feasts. I was telling Jordan this morning, I wish we had because this morning would make a lot more sense if we'd study those three. Um, but whenever we get there, whenever we get to trumpets and day of atonement and the feast of tabernacles, I think that having heard this once, you'll really get the significance of it um, because there's a lot that's wrapped up here in the fulfillment of these feast days, including the blasting of the shofar and all the implications of that trumpet. Um, but let's look at Isaiah 11. Y'all remember that? Starts out with this prophecy about a shoot coming from the stump of Jesse. Uh, the spirit of God's gonna rest on him and so forth. Clearly, it's talking about Jesus. This is messianic, right? Pointing ahead to Christ. Well, listen to what it says in 11 and 12. Isaiah says, in that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains from his people from uh, Assyria, Egypt, Pathos, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, from the coastlands. And it says he will raise a signal for the nations and he will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Well, what you've got here in this messianic prophecy about Christ is a picture of his gathering the remnant of Israel together, right? Of bringing people back together uh, and when does this happen? It says there's gonna be a signal for the nations. That sounds like a shofar to me. I think a big trumpet blast is a signal. And let's look at another kind of similar text in Isaiah 27. And this is part of, uh, if y'all remember, Isaiah's little apocalypse. We've referenced this several times. And every time we have, I've tried to show you that Isaiah's little apocalypse was fulfilled in 70 AD. There's imagery all over the place that found its fulfillment then. But look at uh, verses 12 and 13. It says, in that day, same as Isaiah 11, right? In that day, from the river Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, the Lord will thresh out the grain and you will be gleaned one by one, O people of Israel. And in that day, a great trumpet will be blown 
And those who were lost in the land of Assyria, those who were driven out to Egypt, will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Notice it says, in that day. That's the same way Isaiah 11 starts, right? But here we see that a great trumpet blows. Isaiah 11 said that he would raise a signal for the nations. Here, people are gathered from all over to worship. What do we see in Isaiah 11? People are gathered from all over. So we've got the same thing going on here. This is the same event. It's the same day. But notice the gleaning language. It says you will be gleaned one by one. This is talking about judgment. This is judgment language. You know what this is? This is Daniel 12. This is Matthew 13, Matthew 16, Revelation 14, and many, many others. So piecing this all together, we see in Isaiah that at the blast of the trumpet, the dead are raised and they're judged and the remnant of Israel are all gathered together with the Lord. Well, pay attention to that last part. Gathered together with the Lord in the presence of Yahweh, right? In the presence of God. Where did dead people go in the old covenant age? They didn't go to heaven, right? Where did dead people go when Jesus is giving the Olivet Discourse? They didn't go to heaven. They went to Sheol. It was the realm of the dead. Sheol, Hades, whatever you want to call it. Um, But it was not in the presence of God. Uh, They went to the realm of the dead. They were separated from God. They all longed to be in the presence of God, but they didn't have it. But the text here is telling us that at the sound of the trumpet or at the resurrection, the dead saints get to go into the, into the presence of God. They get to go into heaven, and that's the point. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when? At the last trumpet. Huh. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Pay attention to that last line. The dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. According to Paul, two things happen when that trumpet blasts, right? He says, number one, the dead will be raised imperishable. What does this mean? Well, he's talking about the dead in Christ being resurrected out of Hades, out of of that separation from God, right? He's saying (coughs) when the trumpet sounds, those Old Testament saints are going to heaven. But number two, he says, uh, or sorry, that what Paul's describing here is that same gathering of Isaiah 11 and 27 and Matthew 24. When Jesus is talking about gathering his elect from the four corners, we're all talking about the same thing. So that's Paul's point number one. But point number two, he says, we shall all be changed. Well, who are the we? Well, that's in reference to those who are still alive whenever the trumpet sounds, whenever this event happens. And to understand this more clearly, let's look at a parallel passage which is in 1 Thessalonians 4. And this is a big one. This is the rapture passage. You know, this is the one where everybody gets body zooming off planet Earth. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18. He says, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. That's those who are dead already. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, and the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet of God. And look what happens after this trumpet. He says, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then, meaning after that, we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Again, this is the verse where people get physical bodies shooting off the planet. Um, I don't buy that. I don't think it works because this is a parallel to 1 Corinthians 15. They're saying the same thing. Both texts say that when this trumpet blows, number one, the dead in Christ rise first, meaning the Old Testament saints rise. They're, They're resurrected out of Hades into the presence of God. This isn't a physical bodily thing. This is a spiritual transfer, okay? They're moving from not in the presence of God into the presence of God. So that happens first, but then look what Paul says. He says, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. It's the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says, and we shall be changed. The we are those that aren't dead yet, right? The we are those living Christians when this happens. So that change that he's talking about there is not body shooting off the planet. It's, he's talking about the corruptible putting on the incorruptible. He says it plain as day there in Thessalonians. 
He says the saints who are living are caught up together. In the Greek, that's, I think it's the word harpazo, if I'm saying it right. Um, didn't put it in here, but it, it's the idea of being seized, of being snatched. So the believers are seized into the clouds. Um, when we were talking about cloud comings and all that, do you remember uh, what was in the clouds in the Old Testament? Presence of God. And that's the point. The clouds represent the presence of God. So he's saying that at the time this trumpet blast, the believers were seized, or we may say they were gathered, right? Like from the four corners of the heavens, they were gathered into the presence of God. And what's the point? Paul says, so we will always be with the Lord. This was a covenantal shift. This was people entering into God's presence for the first time ever. And now when you and me die, guess what? We don't go to Sheol. We don't go to Hades. When we breathe our last here, we go directly into the presence of God. And that's Paul's point. So we will always be with the Lord. It's interesting too that whenever Paul says there in Thessalonians, he says the Lord will descend from heaven. That word he uses for descend was directly associated with the high priest coming out of the temple on the day of atonement. And then what would happen is the high priest would come out to announce that the atonement was complete. And this is huge because under that sacrificial system, under the old covenant, nobody had righteousness on day of atonement until that priest came back out of the temple. All right, he would go into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God once a year on behalf of the people. And you know what the people would do? They would sit outside the temple on pins and needles waiting on that priest to come back out. Because if he never came back out, that wasn't good. That meant their sin wasn't covered, right? But if he did come back out, then the atonement was then complete and their sins were covered for another year. But the point is, nobody had righteousness until that priest came back out of that temple. Well, friends, we see the exact same thing is true in the redemptive work and plan of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Look at what Luke 21, 28 said again. He said, now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads. Why? Because your redemption is drawing near. Because your redemption is drawing near. Well, you may say, well, wait a minute. Weren't these Christians already redeemed? Uh, Not fully. No. No, they weren't. They had redemption but they did not have the fullness of it. They had righteousness, but they did not have the fullness of it. And I can show you. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 7. It says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So did they have redemption? Yes. Yes, he says we have redemption through his blood. Well, let's keep going. Verses 13 and 14. In him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Wait a minute, I thought they had it already. But here he's saying that they don't have possession yet. Let's keep going, verse 30. Add this to the mix. He says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Well, that day of redemption that Paul is speaking of is that day the trumpet sounds, right? And the saints of God, both living and dead, are spiritually gathered into the presence of God. So they had it, but they didn't have it. They were in what we know as the already not yet. It was that 40-year period um, where things were just different. But look what, or that's why Jesus says in Luke 21, he says, when you see these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Because that is the day of redemption that Paul was looking ahead to in Ephesians. You see, all these things, again, they're perfectly connected. Now, as y'all know, I I got sick last week. Very sick, actually. I was pretty down and out for a couple days, and it wasn't the flu. I had had COVID. Um, But for about, I'm telling you this for a reason. For about three days, I didn't do anything besides sleep, shiver, and sweat. Okay, I I was down. But as a result of the sickness, I got behind on my daily Bible reading plan. And I got a little chart, and every morning I go in there and read it, you know, check my box, I do my reading. Well, I got behind. So the day that I finally felt good enough to go back there and try to drink some coffee and and read it, I had some catching up to do, and I had to read Hebrews 7 through 10 in one sitting to get caught back up. Um, I actually put this in bold letters at the end of your handout so nobody can say you didn't know. But you have a homework assignment, okay? I want you to do something for me. I want you to read Hebrews 7 through 10 together, all in one sitting today. At some point, I don't care when you do it, just sit down and read them together. I'm so thankful 
that this worked out the way it did because that section of Hebrews is all about Christ being our high priest. It goes right along with what we're talking about this morning. But it's all about him being the high priest and doing that priestly work. Um, And I want to remind you that the seven feast days of Israel were all a type. They, They were a shadow that pointed ahead to the substance of Jesus Christ, and he fulfilled them. Um, but I'll remind you again, because this is we, we have to understand this, that on the Day of Atonement, the priest went into the Holy of Holies. He, he took that sacrifice to God on behalf of the people, but the atonement wasn't complete until he came back out, right? And then he could declare the people righteous. Well, listen to this. Speaking of Jesus being our high priest, doing this priestly work, Hebrews 9, 24 through 28, says, For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. He's going to appear again, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Do you see the picture? The high priest would enter the temple. It says Christ entered the fulfillment of the temple. It says he didn't go into the things made with hands, the copies. He went into heaven, right? The high priest would go in and offer himself year after year. Text says that Christ offered himself once. And it says in verse 28 that Christ will appear a second time not to deal with sin. You remember he dealt with sin the first time by the sacrifice of himself. So why is he coming? Why is Christ going to appear a second time? It says to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Church, Our high priest, Jesus Christ, he had to come back out of the true holy of holies to complete the work of redemption, to declare the people righteous. And that's why they were eagerly waiting for him. They were waiting for that fullness of righteousness, the fullness of redemption to be given to them. And if you don't believe that, look at verse 8. And I'm using the contemporary English version here because it really captures the emphasis of the text better. But it says this, all of this is the Holy Spirit's way of saying no one could enter the most holy place while the tent was still the place of worship. Well, what's the tent? It's the temple. He's saying there, nobody enters the most holy place. Nobody goes into the presence of God as long as that temple is still standing. But guess what? What's happening here in the Olivet Discourse? Jesus is promising the redemption of his people when? at the destruction of Jerusalem. At the same time, that city and that temple go down. This is a perfect fit because this is exactly what our Lord is teaching. Now, I know I've been at it for a while and I'm about to be done, but I want to show you one more thing pertaining to this trumpet and these events, all right? And uh, we kind of talked about this Exodus thing a little bit this morning, but does anybody remember uh, back in the Exodus story how long they roamed around in the wilderness? It was 40 years, right? It was a 40-year period. And the Exodus finally ended when? It ended when the Israelites crossed the Jordan River and they finally entered into the land, right? Now, something that's interesting is once they all crossed the river, um, they circumcised that next generation of men. And we read in Joshua 5, 9, he says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt under you. That reproach that he's speaking of there, that is speaking of the shame that was associated with the bondage of Egypt. The shame, uh, the reproach of being enslaved, basically. So the point is that even though they hadn't actually physically been in Egypt for 40 years, they weren't actually free from that bondage until they finally inherited the land. So it's a picture of even even during that 40-year roaming, they were still enslaved, right? They weren't free yet. Well, do y'all remember what happened right after they crossed the Jordan River? There was that scene where they marched around a big city and blew some trumpets and the city fell down. You remember Jericho? Look at Joshua 6, 15 and 16. 
It says, on the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of day. They marched around the city in the same manner seven times. And it was only on that day when they marched around the city several times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to his people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And I hope y'all are familiar with the story. Basically, they blew the trumpets the seventh time, like God told them to, and the walls fell down, right? And then they took the city. Well, with all that in mind, does anybody know who Matthew paints Jesus out to be right at the beginning of his gospel? The better Moses, the second Moses, the fulfillment of the first Moses. And then there is this second Exodus theme that is all throughout the New Testament. But let me show you the parallels here. How long was the time period uh, between Christ coming, or sorry, between Christ ministry, rather, or death, I should say, and his parousia. It was 30 to 70 AD, 40 years, just like the Exodus, right? Let me show you a passage from Romans 8. We've heard this a thousand times. Romans 8, 19 through 23 says, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who sub subjected it in hope, because the creation itself will also be delivered from the what? The bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption and the redemption of our body, singular, corporate body. According to Paul, here during this period, this second Exodus period, they are under a kind of bondage, just like the Israelites were in the first Exodus, right? In that 40-year period, we have a picture of bondage. Now, he says they're waiting for the redemption of our body. That's the resurrection we were just talking about. So how does this play out? Well, at the end of this 40-year second Exodus period, guess what you find in the book of Revelation? There are seven trumpets, okay? And I'm saying the seventh one is the same one Jesus is talking about, same one Paul talks about in Corinthians and Thessalonians. But God blows these trumpets, and at the last trumpet, the city of Jerusalem goes down, and then the saints are delivered out of that corruptible, perishable, old covenant body of death, raised into the incorruptible, imperishable new covenant body of life, and the saints inherit the new covenant promises forever. They are free from that bondage when the trumpet blows and the city goes down. It's the same picture. It's the Exodus story all over again. And this morning we were talking about them roaming around in tents and stuff, Acts 4. I mean, it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. So there's a ton more that I could say, but I'm out of time, so let's review. Are we waiting today to see some cosmic sign of Jesus in the sky? No, we're not. The sign that Jesus was in heaven, my opinion, was the destruction of Jerusalem by those Roman armies. Do, does tribes of the earth mourning have anything to do with you and me today? No, it doesn't. There are no more tribes of Israel anymore. Their genealogical records were destroyed 2,000 years ago. None of them know what tribe they belong to. If they try to tell you they do, they're liars. Does Christ coming in or on the clouds necessitate a physical, visible, bodily return? Absolutely not. According to Acts 1, they saw him ascend in a cloud and they would see him come back in like manner in a cloud. And finally, are we waiting for God to blow some trumpet, gather his elect, and give us righteousness? No. To quote Pastor David Curtis again, you don't hope for what you have, okay? You and I have access to God, to the Holy of Holies, now. We have a perfect face-to-face -face relationship with God Almighty now. And it's all because God, or because Jesus, perfectly accomplished the plan of redemption. Amen. Amen. 